Good morning. Welcome to today's presentation, How to Talk to Your Teen About Substance Use. This webinar is part of a series hosted by St. Clair County Community Mental Health during the month of September, which is Recover National Recovery Month. Today's session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the CMH YouTube account for future reference. Please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions and add comments you have at any time during this webinar. If time allows, we will answer as many questions as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. Our presenters today are Elise Nichols and Cassidy Livingston. Elise is the outreach coordinator at um, the St. Clair County Community Health Department in Port Huron, where she works to foster partnerships within the community and help connect residents to needed resources. Throughout her time working in public health, she has educated the community on a variety of topics, such as infant safe sleep, teen pregnancy prevention, youth substance abuse, and COVID-19. Nickel holds a master's degree in public health from Grand Valley State University and a bachelor's degree in social relations and policy from Michigan State University. She's a certified health education specialist. Cassidy is a health educator with the St. Clair County Health Department. She graduated from Central Michigan University with a bachelor's degree in public health education with a minor in substance abuse prevention and treatment. Cassidy is currently working on her master's degree in administration through Central Michigan University. With that, I'll turn it over to our presenters. Hi, thank you. I think we're the last presentation of the summit. So again, thank you CMH for um, having us and for um, having a platform for all these agencies to distribute this really important information. Um, as Aubrey said, my name's Elise. I'm the outreach coordinator here at the St. Clair County Health Department. Um, just some housekeeping. I do go by she, hers pronouns, and I'm a white woman. I'm wearing a green shirt today. I have long, uh, dark brown hair. Good morning, everyone. Cassidy from the St. Clair County Health Department. Um, pronouns she, hers. Um, I'm a white woman wearing a white button up with long blonde hair. And we're excited to talk to you guys today. Yep. And so the, pre the presentation today is going to cover how to talk to teens about substance use. And so we just wanted to get a sense if everybody could kind of jump in the, the chat here. Are you a professional? And if you are, can, if you could tell us what your role is at your agency, are you a teacher, a social worker? A parent. Yeah, even a parent. Um, so if you could just jump in the chat and let us know who our audience is today. Okay, thank you. Nurse, okay. substance counselor, use. social workers, clinician. Case manager, therapist, great. Okay. Great. Well, welcome everyone. Yeah, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. All right. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us. I still see the chat going through, so thank you. Um, also another housekeeping item, um, we're gonna try to answer questions as they come up during the presentation. Um, so if you have questions as we begin, go ahead and pop them into the chat box and we will address them. Um, and if not, um, we can at the end as well. Um, so how to talk to teens about substance use. There's a couple of things we're gonna cover today, um, but our main goal is that after this presentation, um, we will be able to talk to teens about the implications of substance use, using substances and the importance of prevention. Um, so here at the health department, we harp on prevention. Prevention is key, right? So we want to touch on those um, prevention key points as well. Um, additionally, we want to be able to identify the warning signs of teen substance use. We're going to touch on mood and personality, physical signs, um, emotional signs, things like that, of what might indicate that a teen is using substances. All right, so we just wanted to set the stage of uh, what our teens locally here are using. If you tuned into our last presentation, we covered this, but again, we just want to make sure everybody's um, informed on this. Here are the top four substances used by youth, and this is St. Clair County youth, um, but it's pretty, if you look at Michigan and the United States, it, it tracks with uh, those uh, bigger populations as well. So our number one um, use, I guess, uh, product here locally from teens is vaping. So in 2022, 17% of St. Clair County teens reported vaping use in the past 30 days. Um, we also have alcohol, 
Uh, nearly 13% of St. Clair County teens reported drinking alcohol within the past 30 days. Uh, marijuana, nearly 14% of St. Clair County teens reported using marijuana within the past 30 days. And then this kind of falls below the top three, but prescription drugs, we felt it was important to include this one. Um, about 4% of St. Clair County teens reported using prescription drugs, the key here, that were not prescribed to them within the past 30 days. And again, this um, information, it comes from a MyFi survey. It's a survey that's put out by um, the state of Michigan, specifically the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And we do believe that these numbers are a little bit lower because of the COVID-19 pandemic and reporting um, issues with that. We expect, unfortunately, that when we go through our next cycle, the numbers will rebound. So we just want to give that information to you all um, right up front. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that the MyFi survey, um, which is a Michigan profile for healthy youth, it kind of covers a lot of risk factors, um, substance use, violence, physical activity, nutrition, sexual behavior, and emotional health. And this survey is specific to grades 7, 9, and 11. Um, so when we talk about um, the MyFi survey for this particular data, we also wanted to note that not all schools participate in the survey. So uh, we hope to see an increase as that, in that as well. Yeah, we just had a question come up. Is this, is this presentation different than the last one? Yes, it is. We just wanted to give some basic um, precursor information before we dived into um, the how to talk to teens portion of this. Okay. Okay. So a lot of times you'll hear a teen or someone who's using substances say it's just experimentation, right? They're just trying something different. Maybe they're trying a substance to fit in, things like that. But what data shows is that 90% of addictions begin in adolescence. So right at that critical stage is when teens start using substances and that can lead to addictions in adulthood. We also know that 90% of underage drinking is binge drinking. So we know that, you know, these underage youth are not, you know, drinking one drink, you know, here and then they're binge drinking um, or consuming enough drinks where it is considered binge drinking within a period of time. So that's important to know. And then we also know that substance use can have long-term implications on a developing brain, which we'll touch more on on the next slide. Yeah, and just to follow up with that, you know, um, we understand that a lot of young people um, experiment and, and sometimes in popular culture, it's this view that it's a rite of passage to have your first beer or to maybe vape or smoke your, your first cigarette or whatnot. Um, those, those things, especially when done as, as an adolescent, as a teen can really have serious repercussions in that period of your life, but even long-term. So we're gonna cover that as well. Okay, so when we talk about brain development, we're specifically talking about the prefrontal cortex. So that is the last part of the brain that's going to develop um, around the mid-20s. Um, this part of the brain um, works on problem-solving skills, time management, decision-making, uh, reasoning, and impulse control. So we know substances can alter those different areas of the brain um, and management skills when making decisions. Um, and we know that overactive impulse to seek pleasure uh, may result in um, less ability to consider consequences. So when a teen is under the influence, they may be um, having unprotected sex, things like that, um, that could result in some legal complications as well. Um, and we also can see that substance abuse in adolescence specifically can cause learning difficulties and long-term health problems in adulthood. So this critical time for youth when their brain is developing and they're trying new things um, can actually lead to problems in adulthood. Yeah, those passageways of the brain are forming. And if you throw in a substance, it can be uh, really detrimental. So parents, and even I know we have a lot of professionals on here who work with youth, you're a bigger influence than you think. Sometimes, you know, when we're interacting with youth, it may not feel like it. it it is, but um, modeling good behavior and having those conversations is really key. And we know that. Um, so we have some uh, prominent partners who've said that. Kids who say they learn, uh, they learn a lot about the risks of drugs at home are significantly less likely to use drugs. And this is from Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. 
Secondly, SAMHSA, uh, parents have a significant influence in their children's decisions to experiment with alcohol and other drugs. So even when you don't think they're listening, they certainly are. Okay, going back to some more local data from the MyFi survey, 77.6% um, of St. Clair County students reported that they had a parent or other adult talk with them about what they expected them to do or not do when it comes to alcohol or other drug use. I think this is important for us to see because we can see that locally, um, specifically that these conversations are happening. So these younger students are having a parent or a guardian or um, a counselor, any, you know, really any anyone adult. adult figure in their life talking to them about implications of drug use. So we were excited to see this number. Um, obviously we hope it increases, um, but it's good to see that these conversations are happening locally in St. Clair County. Okay, kind of touched on this on the last presentation, but we wanted to talk about some um, adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs data, that is um, prevalent to um, substance use. So the ACEs is a questionnaire. You can complete it, figure out what your score is. Um, and we know that the more ACEs an individual has in childhood um, is linked to negative health outcomes in adulthood. So this is something, um, ACEs, that the health department has really um, focused down on and we're looking into now that we have this data available to us. Um, and this graphic here on the screen looks at how we compare um, statewide and then nationally. So one of the questions on the ACEs questionnaire um, talks about living with anyone who was a problem drinker, um, who used illicit street drugs or abused prescription medication. And in the county, we're at about 37.8%, which when we look at the state and national um, averages, we're at about 27. So we're higher, um, which is not great to see. The important thing to note about ACEs when we talk about them, these are adults who are reporting on their childhood experiences. So we know ACEs can, can't be reversed, um, but we know they can be prevented. So it's really focusing on um, adults who are ensuring that, you know, kids um, or youth, you know, we're talking about ages zero to 17 with ACEs, have a healthy home to grow up in. Yeah. Um, ACEs touches on living with parents who are divorced, um, physical abuse at the home. Um, but these are adults who reported this scenario in their childhood. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I mean, we are 10 points, you know, percentage points higher than the state um, and national average, which is very significant. And just some of the questions they ask on the ACEs survey are, did you feel safe in your home? Um, obviously, a substance use with the parent. Um, did you have enough food to eat? Was there ever any kind of abuse, sexual, emotional? There's a lot of um, questions there. And we locally have our partners at MSU Extension who do those presentations and can kind of do that work with folks if you're interested. Um, but just as Cassidy said, this is adults who reported this. And unfortunately, we know that um, some of these things can be um, passed down. So we just want to make sure that the adults are informed so they can make some better choices with their youth right now um, and how they handle different situations. Yeah, and I see a question, is there a place to find this data for other counties in the state of Michigan? Um, we have this data from conducting our um, community health needs assessment. So I would see if the county you're interested in has that available um, or look for resources, you know, like the CDC or things like that, that you may be able to break it down. Yeah, good question. And it really depends on, so it depends on the school, if they want to opt in or out for that data um, and or have their kids take it. And then they can also opt in or out to release that data. Um, we thankfully here in St. Clair County have a great relationship with our school system. So we do a countywide report, which will be coming out here at probably the end of our um, calendar year, beginning of the next calendar year. Um, but yeah, depending on where you're at, you're gonna have to reach out to the health department or that local school. All right, so we want to. I want to be mindful of time here and make sure we get through all of our slides. So the next piece of this, if you're a parent, if you're a professional, you need to make sure that you have multiple conversations and that they're ongoing. It's not just a singular conversation where you put a lot of weight on it. 
It's not the talk, which we hear a lot about, I think, in shows and popular culture. It's something that needs to be reiterated over and over and over again. So how would you start that conversation? Do not plan a spec. This is just some tips and tricks. Don't plan a special meeting. Um, we've seen that when there's a special meeting, typically there can be a lot of anxiety, both for the parent or whoever the professional is talking and also the student. They're kind of wondering how this is gonna go. It's uncomfortable. Um, just initiate a conversation when you are comfortable and the team is comfortable and in a more relaxed environment. Um, and then also take advantage of some teachable moments. Maybe it's in a movie or TV show. You see a character who's struggling with substance use. Bring that up, you could say. So I see this character is, you know, struggling with vaping. What do you think about that? Has Have you ever tried vaping? Um, have you been offered a vape? And again, it might be a little clunky at the beginning, those first couple conversations, but the more you do it, the easier it's going to be both for you and that student. Then you can also take advantage of other teachable moments. Maybe there's a family or friend um, who is using a substance and you could kind of use that as a teachable moment too. And, and also just have that clear line of communication. What do you think about that? Um, what are the ways that this might be impacting that person's life, your, your relationship with them? Have them kind of think critically about um, the negative impacts of that use. Yeah, right. We don't want to get a text that says, we're going to talk when you get home, right? It's going to cause panic. So we want to make sure that that's not really happening. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to set up this video. Um, we're all about keeping things local here. We have the local data. We have some local educators. We also formally here at the health department had a local coalition called Speak that worked to prevent substance use um, amongst teens that has now migrated over to CMH under their Community Services Coordinating Body, CSCB. Um, but we, for probably about a year during the pandemic, we did something called Parents Perspective with Mike and Amy. Mike works over at Impact. Amy is our, um, now our nursing director, has a lot of experience with prevention. And so they would, they would talk about these things just as we're talking about from a parent's perspective. So we wanted to give you a little quick peek of a video that we had done. I think Cassie's going to pull it up for me. There we go. Oh, tone. Yes, tone is important. How about you, Mike? Body language, anything important to you as far as conversations? Yeah, both actually. And I don't know if a lot of you are aware of this. I did this study before. They said that 55% of what you say comes from your body language. 38% comes from your tone and inflection. Only 7% comes from your words. And so I've been very mindful of that myself because one, being larger, uh, being loud in general, it's just, I guess, naturally occurring with me. It's just loud and boisterous. There's times where what I'm doing is intimidating. And so when I bring that home to the family, it's the same thing as well, too. I'm one of those, I'll come right home and I'm excited to be home. And you, the second you walk in the door, mom, so-and-so did this or dad, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that. And then I just, you can see it in my face. I'm like, can you just give me like five minutes? And so for me, I've got to really watch how I carry myself. I, you, you can tell where I'm at just by reading my face a lot of times. And so it's huge that when you want to talk with your children about anything, you be mindful of that. And if you have to take a breath, take a breath, but just thinking about that, there's a lot of little things that we can be doing just to make it comfortable. Sitting down, breathing, picking the time that's good to talk. Is five minutes before they go to bed the best time to have a long, drawn-out conversation about why they shouldn't be doing something? No, it's not. Same with you. When you're tired, do you really want to talk? I bet you a lot of times, um, first thing in the morning and last thing at night are not the best times to talk with your children about big things. When they've had a chance to get home and just unwind for a second, same with yourselves. Think about what's important for you and your communication. Like, like when would you like to be able to share things? And why are we picking those times that we don't like for them as well too? I don't know about you. I go to bed at different times than my children do. And so I try to be cognizant of that. They give them plenty of time when things are a little bit calmer, we'll talk about things and not wait right before they go to bed. That's to me, that's the word or when they're hungry. Like, I don't know about yours, but mine like eat like crazy. And if they're hungry, you're not getting a rational conversation out of them anyway. Yeah. 
You are bringing up such great points, Mike, because timing can be everything and knowing when and when not to have a conversation can definitely influence how good that conversation comes out. Okay. So that again was Mike and Amy um, and they teamed up to do that parent perspective with us. And if you're interested in seeing more of that content and what they did, again, they did it probably weekly for over a year. And they talk about communication, substance use, um, and specifically working with teens, with your own teen. Um, that's on our YouTube channel, St. Clair County Health Department. It's under a speak playlist, if you're interested in seeing that. Oops. Okay, so now with kind of some tips and tricks that we've given you guys, um, we're gonna do a little Zoom bomb. Um, so we're gonna pose a question to you guys as the participants. Um, we're gonna give you a couple of seconds to type in your responses. And then when I hit send, I want to get everyone's thoughts on this. So our question to you is, what are some other ways that you may be able to initiate a conversation about substance use um, with a teen? Maybe it's your own teen, or maybe it's someone you work with. Um, so think of some ideas and type those in the chat box. And when I say, um, go ahead, we'll see what you guys have to say. Okay, when you're ready, go ahead and send your chats. Car ride. That's a, that's a big one that we see a lot. Yep. Walk and talks, watching TV, news. news. Just simply yeah. ask when it comes up. Going for a walk, ask, see something in the news ask about the billboards yeah and even Mike had said they might bring it up it might not always be that way mm -hmm. <laughs> not we don't often see that that brought up um on the teens end we often see that the parent has to initiate or the professional has to initiate so yeah listen to music content themes and music I didn't guess what I heard guess what I heard today when it comes up yeah and again you're going to get that's the importance of having these ongoing conversations because I, I remember with my own mom, it was clunky. I knew she really wanted to do it and she, she didn't really know how to navigate it, but the more you do it, the better you're going to be, the better they're going to be. And it's going to be no big deal to talk about it. Yeah, or right. someone said, shared their own previous experience and the consequences, which we're going to touch on that later. So yeah. Great. All right. We're going to move on to the next slide. So how to make it a success. So Mike and Amy had some really good tips about finding the right moment, um, especially given like sleep and hunger. We know those are um, key, especially as a teenager to be mindful of. Um, but sit and listen anywhere, anytime. Just be ready to have that conversation, especially if they bring it up. Um, share your own life experiences, good or bad. Um, maybe it's, I didn't start vaping. I didn't use cigarettes as um, a teenager. And I was asked if I wanted to, there was always that around. I'm so glad I didn't. Or maybe that's not the story for you. Maybe you did engage in, let's just say cigarette smoking. And now you're, you're an adult and you're struggling with it. And you're like, it costs so much money. I'm having some health impacts. Be honest with them about your experiences. Again, they look up to you. You're a, a role model for them. Um, and then this might come after a couple of the initial conversations, but teach refusal skills and how to resist peer pressure. So something we like to talk a lot about here at the health department is like scenarios. So you might ask your teen, so what would you do if someone offered you, again, vaping is number one in our county, so we'll just use vaping as an example, but what would you do if someone offered you a vape? And the, you know, the team might be like, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> or whatever they might say. And you could say, well, let's just say you don't wanna take the vape. What, what could be an excuse? What could be something you wanna say? Maybe it's, I have a test tomorrow, I really can't do that. Or I'm on, maybe uh, sports and athletics are really important to them. I have a game tomorrow, I have practice tomorrow, I can't do that. Or maybe it's, my mom would kill me if she found out I did that, um, or if I had something on me. The more you have those kind of refusal skills in your back pocket, the easier it's going to be for that teen when they are in that situation and they are offered something, that they're going to have something at the tip of their tongue to say. They're going to have an excuse or whatever they might need to get out of there um, and not partake. 
So that's a really, really key part of these conversations, I think, is that scenario, role-playing, talking through what could happen, what you might say. So when they're in that situation, they're ready. Mm -hmm. And they might have to say no repeatedly too, right? You know, when we talk about peer pressure, so standing strong in their stance on what they want to do. Absolutely. Okay, so kind of touch on this a little bit earlier, but um, really resist the urge to lecture. Um, you know, students may come to you looking for um, advice. Maybe they're curious about something and they just want, you know, your thoughts or feedback on it. Um, so resist the urge to lecture and kind of make them feel um, like they're being singled out or, um, you know, things like that. And then be mindful of any family history. Um, we know substances are very prevalent in today's society. So if you have a family member or things like that who may be using substances or having negative effects from using those substances, um, maybe that student um, has kind of made up their own decision, right? They know, you know, what happened to this family member, they don't want to happen to them. So yeah, and unfortunately we know that if there is a family history that, um, there's an increased likelihood of addiction or use amongst those youth. So just being very transparent about that risk, right? Um, and letting them know there is a family history here. If you do engage, um, it could be more problematic. Absolutely. Um, and then kind of talk about the consequences. Um, this kind of goes into if you've had an experience yourself, you know, talking about the bad, talking about the good. Um, but consequences can be health. You know, we talk about long and short-term health effects. Um, you know, it's going to depend on the type of substance, maybe, um, what those consequences could be. And then also relationships. And we when we talk about youth, too, we want to talk about that school aspect, right? Um, in our last presentation, we kind of talked that a lot of teens are getting their substances from an older friend or um, at school, right? So, um, we know that sometimes teachers or principals can find substances. Um, going back to relationships, um, this could neg negatively affect family relationships, friendship relationships, um, any type of relationship. Uh, maybe your teen is in a friend group that is using substances and they choose not to or vice versa. That could cause some problems, right? Because they're not going to fit in um, or, you know, fit in like they thought they were from the beginning. So we want to talk about the consequences, but in a healthy way for a teen to understand. And yeah, and another way we can make it a success is, is, and Cassidy, I have talked about this a million times, but target the conversation and how you um, approach it to that student, to that teen, right? So maybe, you know, for example, I was really into sports and Cassidy was really into student council. I would maybe shift my focus a little bit and say, well, think about the health aspects, Elise. You know, this could, if you're using vapes, it could really impact your performance. You may not be able to participate in that sport, which we know that you really love and love your teammates and want to do. Well, maybe it's different for Cassidy. It could affect maybe her relationships too with her uh, student council friends. Mm -hmm. um, it may if she's using, again, depending on school, they may not allow her to, to engage in that activity, whatever it might be, target it. We know what they like. So make sure that we connect the dots for them about how this could impact them negatively. Right. And we know too, that not everyone receives or engages in conversation the same way. Um, so if you're working with students or youth, or you have a big family of your own, uh, what worked for one um, youth might not work for the next. So kind of also target that conversation of how you know that the teen will interpret the information. Yep. Okay. So here are some preventative strategies. Again, the name of the game in public health and something that we're really passionate about. We don't want people to get to the point where they're in recovery or they need to quit. We want them to never start. That's the ideal, right? That's what we really want to see here locally. So here are some tips to do that. Um, know your teen's activities, pay attention to your teen's whereabouts, find out what adult supervised activities your teen is interested in and encourage him or her to get involved. So something I'd like to, to bring up here, and this is just very recently, was a recommendation that came down, I believe from the CDC um, and some other key partners 
But if there is substances found, to not kick them out of school, to not kick them out of these, these supervised activities, because this is an opportunity for them to really engage and have this adult supervision. We don't want to ostracize them more, push them out of the crowd more because of this behavior. We need to figure out how to support them and to continue for them to engage in things that they like to do. Um, of course, there are going to be consequences, but um, maybe it's not removing them from an educational or an after-school setting. Um, establish rules and consequences. Again, there should be rules and consequences, but explain that um, to them prior. So maybe having that conversation quite young, um, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, I think we could touch on this in our last um, presentation, but the average age locally in our county for people to have their first drink was 13. So we need to have these conversations early. We need to let them know what the rules and consequences are whether it's you as a professional in your building or whether if it's you as a parent, um, it might be if you use a vape pen or if you smoke where marijuana, you're not gonna have the car for an entire month or six months or whatever it might be, car privileges, or you might have to do extra chores, your sister's chores as well for X amount of time. And, and that's non-negotiable. And if you do find something, stick to it. Um, I think I have in here, explain your family rules, such as leaving a party where drug use occurs, and this is big, and not riding in a car with a driver who's been using drugs. Um, if your teen breaks the rules, consistently enforce the consequences. We cannot stress that enough. Um, again, we found in our data from that last MyFi cycle that about 10% of our local youth, youth had driven in a car with somebody who was impaired, which is too high, right? So we need to let them know that's not an expectation um, for them. That's something that we absolutely don't wanna see. Also know your, your teen's friends. If your teen's friends use drugs, your teen might feel pressure to experiment too. Again, that fitting in. Um, and there could be ways you can intervene with that, talk to the school, um, maybe gently usher them into some other activities that have a, a different group of students as well. Some other key strategies, prevention strategies, keep track of prescription drugs. Again, that was number four um, in our top drugs used by youth. Um, so if you take, so take an inventory of all prescription and over-the-counter medications in your home. Let's just say you had a surgery or you had grandma or grandpa come over, make sure that they're secure. And if you have any extra, there's drop boxes all around the county that you can put them in. And I'll just give a little plug here. We have these drug deactivation kits. So you just open the bag, you put in the drug that you have and it deactivates it and you can just throw it away um, in the trash. So there are options to make sure that those don't get into the wrong hands. Um, second, and I think this is probably one of the most important ones, provide support, offer praise and encouragement when your teen succeeds. A strong bond between you and your teen might help prevent your teen from using drugs. So if they feel comfortable talking to you, um, they might be more inclined to bring up some tough issues. Maybe they're offered something, maybe they're in an uncomfortable situation. You can have that dialogue, but also it's just really good to see, um, you know, if they are maybe participating in the basketball team or doing really well in school, highlight that, um, applaud that, let, let them know that you're proud of them. So they, have that positive reinforcement for the good things they're doing. And last but not least, set a good example. If you drink, do so in moderation, use prescription drugs as directed, and don't use illicit drugs. And so for, for folks who may be struggling currently with substance use and can't provide that modeling, um, that's going to be part of the conversation. You're going to let them know, hey, I, I'm struggling, maybe it's right now with cigarettes or drugs or alcohol. Um, and I don't want that for you. Like, I love you. You're the most important thing in my life. And I don't want you to go down the same path as I did. And this is, these are the implications for me. Maybe I can't hold down a job or find a job having financial difficulties. Just be transparent. I want better for you. And, um, I, I, and that would mean not using substances. So again, part of that ongoing conversation. Okay. Now we're going to get into some signs of drug use, um, which, you know, you might see in a teen and kind of prompt that conversation. 
Um, so first we're going to talk about shifts in mood and personality. So, um, you know, if you have a child or you are working with a teen, um, you know them pretty well, right? So you know when something is off or something may seem a little um, out of the ordinary. Um, so maybe they are withdrawn or depressed, less motivated. Um, they start to become hard to communicate with um, and uncooperative. Um, and maybe they're secretive. They're going out. You don't know where they're going um, or they're with friends and they're not transparent about what they're doing. Um, or maybe they're unable to focus. And I think when we talk about these warning signs, you know, each drug is going to affect an individual differently, um, yeah. each substance. So these are just some examples um, that we're going to touch on. Um, and maybe they have a sudden loss of inhibitions. They're not um, making good decisions. They're doing things kind of out of the ordinary. And then when we talk about maybe hyperactive or unusually elated. So this goes back to depending on the substance it could have one or both of these effects potentially on someone. Yeah. As we know, like alcohol and marijuana can make, make you more in a depressive state, make you more withdrawn and other drugs, such as like we call them club drugs, MDMA, Molly, mm -hmm. ecstasy. Um, those will make you more hyperactive and energetic. So again, those sudden shifts are something to look for. Okay. And then some behavioral changes. I won't read through all these necessarily, but wanted to touch on a couple um, a change in relationship with family members or friends. Um, teens have a lot of friends. You know, a lot of teens have that best friend or that friend group that you know that they're hanging out with um, or family. Um, you know, maybe they're disengaging from family events. They're hanging out with a different friend group, things like that. Um, absenteeism or loss of interest in school or work activities. Like Elise kind of talked about, maybe they're an athlete, maybe they're um, in drama club or band and they're disengaging from those activities and they're not as excited as they normally would be to participate. Um, locking doors, that kind of goes to being secretive. Um, if they're breaking curfew, um, using over-the-counter products that may hide some of these substances, um, like eye drops, kind of to hide those red or glossy eyes that may be caused from using a substance. Um, lack of coordination, we know substances can impair the body. Um, so that's going to affect those, you know, coordinating and balance kind of parts of the brain, right? Um, having periods of sleeplessness or, you know, then they need, they have this energy and then they need this catch up sleep, right? So they're go, go, go. And then maybe on the weekends, they just sleep all weekend. Um, so we kind of see those highs and lows when it comes to energy. And then using, pro, you know, products like gum or mints to cover up their breath. If they're using a substance, you know, maybe like marijuana or a vape that has maybe like a fruity scent, um, they may be covering that up with um, things like chewing gum or mints. Yeah. And, you know, especially it's a key sign if they don't ever use that. And then all of a sudden you're seeing some of these signs um, that could be kind of telling that they're using something. Some other signs of drug use um, would include hygiene and appearance, so smell of smoke or other unusual smells on breath or on clothes. We know that marijuana specifically can have a really potent smell, smell like a skunk, but and even cigarettes as well can be a pretty potent smell. But when we think of vapes, they can be pretty fruity and smell good and, and may be undetectable. Um, so it just depends, again, on the substance. Messier than usual appearance, poor hygiene. So maybe they're not brushing their teeth as, as regularly or at all, at all, showering, letting their hair grow out, um, just general maintenance that they cutting their toenails, fingernails, shaving, especially for um, people who identify as male could be a, 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 tell, a telltale sign. Frequent, frequently red or flushed cheeks or face. Um, Burns or soot on fingers or lips. Again, if you're, you have the photo here, if you're lighting something up um, and having to hold it there, you might be seeing some of the, those burns. And last but not least, track marks on arms or legs. And we have a photo of this uh, on the top there. So that's for people who are injecting drugs. We see that it's not as common in our teen um, population, but we do still see some of that. So we wanted to include some of those markers. Okay. And lastly, going to touch on physical health. Um, maybe they're frequently sick and they're, you know, known to be a healthy and bubbly 
team, right? Um, they're tired and lethargic. Um, maybe they have a nosebleeds or runny nose. We know some substances like inhalants can kind of cause that effect. Um, sore spots around the mouth. Elise, Elise kind of touched on that one. Sudden um, or dramatic weight loss or gain. We know substances target that area of the brain, right? That's you're going to have cravings or maybe a loss of appetite. So we want to watch for that. Um, specifically sudden or dramatic, right? Um, skin abrasions or bruises, um, seizures and or vomiting, um, which we know some of these signs also, right? When we talk about, you know, having too much substance in the system or overdosing, things like that, um, seizures or vomiting is, you know, a key sign for that. Okay. And we want to include this because we know that um, our teens are on the phone all the time, as are a lot of us, right, adults. So we wanted to give you all a breakdown of what some of these emojis are used for in terms of drug use. And this came from the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. We saw it and we thought, wow, this is really powerful. It could be helpful to include in the presentation. So fake prescription drugs, we have, um, I'm just putting, hovering the cursor over so you can see so we have some of those emojis that represent that. Xanax, we know Adderall is something that a lot, I don't want to say a lot of youth, but that we know that youth can take. Dealer signals, there's a lot of those um, money signs with them. High potency, the rocket, the grenade, kind of the bomb going off. Universal for drugs is that maple leaf. And large batch is a cookie. Other drugs, we have these emojis, heroin, cocaine. We know that sometimes it can be uh, called snow, like on the street. So that's not, um, I guess we're not super surprised to see those emojis being used, but even something like the eight ball, <laughs> uh, the key, the tongue sticking out, happy face, MD MDMA and Molly, that's considered more club drugs. Those are drugs that people typically take in a group setting at festivals and parties. So um, they can feel more connected. So that might be where the heart's coming from. Mushrooms, pretty self-explanatory. Cough syrup. And then marijuana, it's that puff. We have the, the fire sign and then some other greenery in there as well, the clover. So just something to keep in mind. Again, there might be, it might not just be one thing, right? It might be, you're seeing these emojis, you're seeing a change in appearance. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they're more disengaged in school. It's a couple things and you're just, something's not right and you bring it up. Um, so these are just some of the signs to look for. And if they come in multiples, definitely um, speak up and say something. Okay. So we've had the conversation, right? We've learned how to make it successful and we're talking about some warning signs. Um, now we're gonna touch on products to look for, um, which I'll say the emojis was new to me too, right? Because we all use emojis, but like Elise said, if it's co-occurring with some other warning signs, that's maybe when to intervene. Um, so products to look for, right? All of these on the screen look like everyday items or items that you can find maybe in a team's room or area where they hang out. Um, so we're looking at on the left here, we see a hairbrush and a little um, discrete battery. So what these do is you can unscrew the top of these products and hide substances in there, money, things like that. You see a little USB drive. The, the thing with these type of products that, you know, can be used to cover a substance, they're targeted towards that safe safety and security audience. So um, things, you know, when you think about like a safe, you know, maybe somebody wants to hide their cash in there, hide, you know, something that's valuable to them in these things, but they can also be used to hide substances. Um, you can see that sweatshirt in the middle, the gray sweatshirt. Um, it has a little pocket um, for like a bottle of alcohol or maybe another substance. And then the, the drawstring on the hoodie actually um, contains a vape. Um, so you can put a substance in there and use it like that. And you know, it may look average for someone. Um, the water bottle looks like an average water bottle, right? Well, you can see that um, when you unscrew it, you can put things in there. Um, a little smartwatch, when you take off the face of the watch, there's a little compartment in there. And then even things like a key fob, right? I mean, um, maybe if your teen isn't old enough to drive or 
you know, that may not be something that is found, but can also be opened up to hide substances. So we're not saying that all of these things could equal, you know, that a teen is using substances, but things to look out for when it looks out of the ordinary. Yeah. Why do they all of a sudden have these Asani water bottles <laughs> all over the room, right? Or not even uh, many, but just one. Um, just again, you know, your teen, again, as professionals or as parents better than anybody. And I'm sure you're going in the room a lot. Maybe doing the laundry, you're going to pick up on things. That's for sure. So other common places, substances are concealed, of course, inside the drawers beneath or between other items. Um, we know a lot of parents will come in and, and maybe put their laundry away for their teen. Others may not, but that could be a place where they're hiding something in small boxes or cases, think jewelry, makeup, or pencil cases or cases for earbuds. Again, a lot of these substances now um, and the devices can be really quite small. So they could be really discreet and easy to hide versus something back in the day that might've been a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. um, under a bed or other pieces of furniture, we've seen people put them in a potted plant and bury it in the dirt. In, the dirt. Um, in between are inside books, under a loose floorboard, inside over-the-counter medicine uh, containers. So maybe your family finishes up an ibuprofen bottle. Um, they might take that bottle and put in their own substances. Again, things that aren't prescribed to them to kind of mask what they're really taking. Then also inside empty candy bags, such as M&Ms or Skittles is something that um, we've also seen. Okay, so we want to do one more Zoom bomb today as we kind of wrap this up. Um, so here's a scenario, same type of thing. We'll state the question, kind of hold on to your answer um, until we let you type it into the chat. Um, so you find a disposable vape pen in your teenager's coat pocket, or maybe you're working with an individual and you find it um, when you were doing laundry or maybe a different activity. Um, so how do you react or handle the situation? So we'll give you a couple seconds to think and type out your responses. Again, vape pens are very common now. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to use this you're, as you're an example. Teacher, right, and you find it at school, things like that. Yeah. Okay, if you're ready, go ahead. Okay, ask if they're using it. Can you tell me a little bit more about this? Calmly, yes, Chris. Take a humorous approach uh, before a serious conversation. That's one way. Ask questions. Can you tell me about this? Ask questions calmly. Hold on to the vape pen and wait until a time when teen is calm. Bring it out and ask calmly. Tell me more about this. Make an inquiry, not an accusation. Stay calm. Be right, relatable. you don't want to lecture right away. And that can be hard, right? Um, it can be difficult when you find something and you love your your teen or and you may care about if, if you're not, a parent, you may really care about this teen in a professional setting. You want the best of them. Um, I think a lot of parents, their initial reaction might be to be really upset, to be angry. But if we can just take a step back, I think being calm is absolutely key. And maybe it's not confronting them right in the moment that you find it. Maybe it's you discuss it with your partner, you discuss it with somebody else at work about how you want to handle it. Think through what you want to say and then have that conversation. So we have some other tips on that as well. We have some other comments coming in. All right, don't intimidate or assume. Ask about why you found it, allow them to respond. Yeah, that goes back to having kind of be prepared to be, to have the conversation and be open and available. Yep. So what do you do if you find something? Um, try to understand why. So these are two key questions we really encourage folks to, to use if they do find something. Again, we're all about prevention, but we know that some of these products can be more easily accessible than others. So what do you enjoy about, let's just say, vaping, right? You find it, you could say, what, what, what do you enjoy about it? And maybe they might say, well, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel included. Or you could also say, how does vaping make you feel, right? We're just using vaping as an example. And maybe there's something to that, right? Maybe they have a lot of anxiety and they're using it as a tool to tampen that down. Well, maybe that's something we can address without using vapes and something we can work on together. Maybe it's making you feel more included in your friend setting. Okay, you may be feeling isolated and lonely. What are some ways we can 
get you engaged with other people, uh, find a group um, that you gel with, that's the root of the problem. And you're just using vapes as kind of the tool to get there. So again, finding the why is incredibly important. Instead of just saying, well, you can't do that anymore. I'm absolutely so upset. This is, this is over. I'm throwing it away. You got to get down to the meat and potatoes of what's really happening and the why. Also, a key part here is challenge children on their perceptions of norms. So we just had some um, information we gathered from that last MiFi cycle. So nearly a quarter of students thought that half or more of the student body in their grade drank alcohol sometime in the past month. So a lot of kids are thinking that people are use, are drinking more than they are. I mean, 50 to 70%, they're thinking that that many people are using. That That's just not the reality of what's happening. Um, again, about 20, a little more than 20% of students thought that half or more of the students in their grade use marijuana in the past month. So again, playing into that, feeling included, doing it because everybody else is doing it, we can shut that down right away. Not everybody's doing it. Um, in fact, a majority of people are not doing it. And so sometimes perceptions can be um, a, a really a harmful thing because um, it's really not happening at the scale that they might believe it is. Okay, so I um, wanted to provide um, some state and national resources. Um, if maybe you are, um, you have a team that's struggling or you work with a team that may be struggling. Um, My Life, My Quit is um, specifically for youth 18 um, years old and younger. Um, this is specific to vaping and tobacco and nicotine resources. It's kind of a telephone, online coaching um, avenue. Um, texts and emails also available. You can text or call Start My Quit to the phone number listed on the slide. Um, this is quitting um, for teens and young adults also. Uh, you can text Stitch Vape to a number. Um, it's free and anonymous um, text messaging program. And it kind of incorporates messages from other people who have maybe struggled with e-cigarettes as well. Um, and we'll send the individual evidence-based tips and strategies on how to quit and stay quit, right? So when we say stay quit, we're talking, they quit the substance and they're not going to re-engage um, with that substance. SAMHSA's National Helpline. Um, I see this advertised all the time, which I think is great. This um, co-occurs with mental and substance use disorders, um, and it, it can provide referrals to local treatment facilities, support groups, um, and different organizations where someone might be able to go for help. I think the key in all of these is that it's anonymous, um, so you can feel safe and secure um, if a student or you know a teen has to reach out, um, that it's safe and secure, it's confidential, and all these resources are, are available 24 seven. So that's really great. Yeah, and I'll just add here that that top one, My Life, My Quit is Michigan specific. And this is quitting and SAMHSA, those are national. Um, and the cool thing about My Life, My Quit is, I think it was in early 2000s, they started this helpline called um, My Quit through the state of Michigan. And now it's evolved to not only have, you know, 18 plus, but they also have something specific for folks who are younger and includes people who are struggling with traditional cigarettes and vaping. So sometimes we see there's a disconnect. We see a lot of resources for cigarettes, but vaping resources are coming up more and more now, which is really important because we know that's a huge issue, not only locally, but state and nationally. So some local resources, um, again, prevention is key and we do prevention here at the health department. We have our teen health um, professionals and teen health, they are in several schools. I would say most of the schools here in our county, in St. Clair County, we have a nurse. So she can go into the classroom and provide this substance use prevention programming, mental health programming um, to students at request. We can also do mental health and substance use counseling. So maybe something has already occurred and we can come in at that point, or they can come in, I should say, and see us. Um, STI testing and treatment and pregnancy testing, again, if you're not making the best choices when you're maybe under, under the influence and you might need some of those services. 
We also have a personal health clinic who also does everything that we do in teen health um, with the addition of the SSP program. So we have a syringe service program here in St. Clair County um, where people can exchange used needles for clean needles to make sure they're not reusing the same ones and potentially getting some bloodborne diseases like HIV, hepatitis. And then some honorable mentions, um, additional resources being Region 10 Access Line. They can also connect people to local mm -hmm. places that can help with maybe it's recovery, maybe you're in active addiction, maybe you need treatment. Mm -hmm. um, they can do all of that um, on the phone with you as well. And then of course, our great partners at Community Mental Health, They we know that there's a link between um, substance use and mental health oftentimes. So they have a lot of great programming at community mental health as well to serve folks. And we just wanted to take a minute to um, provide our contact information. Again, I'm Elise um, and that's my email. And we have Cassidy here as well. So if you do have any questions that we might not be able to get to today, feel free to give us an email and we can um, hopefully answer that question for you. Okay. Go ahead. I see you. <laughs> oh, I can't hear y'all. There we go. Me, there we go. <laughs> it's our last webinar. Of course, I forgot <laughs> to unmute. <laughs> uh, thank you, Elise and Cassidy, for your time and the information today and to everyone who's attended the session. To recap, today's presentation um, was the last one of our webinars scheduled throughout the month of September. Um, you can view previous registers on our YouTube page. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Beth.